Hello, Jessica. Thank you so much for offering this incredible opportunity for our Club Med Virtual members. My name is Mariana, and I'm the event spokesperson for Club Med Virtual. I'll be leading today's session, reading any comments posted in the chat, and facilitating the conversation as we go along. Before we start, I want to remind everyone to maintain proper etiquette and please keep, please keep themselves on mute unless Jessica specifies otherwise. If you have any questions, please post them in the chat and we will address them as we proceed through the session. A Google survey will be administered for Wayne State University students at the very end of the session to verify your attendance and will close 30 minutes after the session terminates. Please stay on the call for at least five minutes after the session is over to ensure that the survey is working for you. This session will also be posted on YouTube if you are unable to attend or want to revisit certain topics that Jessica discusses today. But you cannot receive shadow or attendance hours if you are not present in the call and complete the survey. All right, Jessica, you can get started. Yeah, hi everyone. I'll go ahead and introduce myself. I am going to share screen for most of the time. Um, I have a presentation, it'll take probably about a half hour or 35 minutes, and then the rest will be available for Q&A. I do apologize, I do have another presentation at seven, so I do have to hop right off. Um, but I will put my email in the chat as well, um, and you can send me an email with any questions maybe you think of after that I couldn't get to today. Um, thank you all for attending too. I am an admissions counselor on our Grand Rapids campus. So for our first and second year med school students, they will be at either the Grand Rapids or East Lansing campuses, and we have an admissions office on both of those. I'll touch a little bit more on that on the presentation though. So I will go ahead and share screen. I am a co-host, right? Okay. Cool. Where is me? Okay, and if you can't see it, somebody feel free to, to say something. But I will go ahead and share. Um, so again, with the College of Human Medicine at MSU, um, Michigan actually has quite a few med schools for the size of our state. Um, I think we have seven or eight med schools and there are over 150 in the United States. So it's really great that you are all interested in us and who we are. Um, we've received over 11,000 applications so far this cycle for only 190 seats in our next incoming class. So learning as much as you can about the medical schools that you're interested in, their programs and curriculum is a great way for you to figure out what's a good spot for you. Um, as when we read your applications, we're trying to figure that out too, if you're a good spot or if you're a good candidate for us and if we're a good candidate for you. So we'll go through the mission first. Um, CHM is the nation's first community-based medical school. Um, we're uniquely positioned with our new curriculum to provide students with comprehensive clinical training early and often. We'll touch on the shared discovery and how that's kind of innovative throughout the country. Um, we're one of the only schools really focusing on curriculum like that, although a lot of schools are switching over to it. We've ranked in the top 10 for our social mission for the college. So when you see our verbatim mission on the next slide, um, it's everybody's got a mission, but I can say that MSU's College of Human Medicine is the most mission-centric place I've ever worked. Um, every organization, regardless of industry, regardless of ed, ed, um, type of education they're, they're offering has a mission and we just really focus in on it. We have seven community campuses with over 50 affiliated hospitals and clinics, and you'll see a little map of that as well. So Michigan State University College of Human Medicine is committed to educating exemplary physicians and scholars discovering and disseminating new knowledge and providing service at home and abroad. We enhance our communities by providing outstanding primary and specialty care, promoting the dignity and inclusion of all people and responding to the needs of the medically underserved. So as you go through thinking about the type of physician you would like to be, figuring out whether um, you know, your Michigan communities matter to you, serving underserved communities matter to you, um, and whether you'd be a good fit for the College of Human Medicine. So it said that we had seven statewide campuses. So these campuses um, are again in your third and fourth year. So you'll see Grand Rapids and East Lansing. And those would be your two that you choose from in your first and second year. Um, I'll go ahead and answer a very frequent question that we get. 
how, how are we placed into our first and second year campuses, you do get to select a preference and we try our best to honor that. Um, Grand Rapids always has a wait list as um, far back as I can remember. And then if you choose East Lansing, you're pretty much going to get that campus. So if you want Grand Rapids, there's a good chance you'll get it. Most of the wait list gets off the wait list every year, but it really just depends on the year and what people want. When you're getting ready to start your third year, you'll get placed into a different campus. And some of that will be based on what your interests are. Did you choose one of our certificate programs like uh, leadership for the medically underserved, um, leadership in rural medicine, public health, something like that, that could kind of dictate where you're headed for your third and fourth year. But otherwise you still do get some preference um, and choice. You could choose Grand Rapids or Lansing again, but you could choose Southfield, you could choose Traverse City, that sort of thing. And all of the hospitals um, that you'll travel to throughout your time in those locations are kind of labeled there. So we'll talk a little bit about our students. The cool thing about the curriculum is that you move through, um, even within the small 190 students that enter each year, you move through in an even smaller cohort um, in your learning society and you get to know those same people throughout the time. Um, so you really get to have your own community within a community. The students that we tend to see be most successful have excellent interpersonal skills, are diverse in terms of gender, age, academic major, personal experience, culture, and ethnicity, and come to us with substantial human service, clinical experience, and social responsibility. And you'll see that continue. Um, we do have a pretty, a pretty basic um, um, like our commitment that you have to do for community service as a student with us most students far and away exceed that expectation. Um, those are just the types of students that, that really excel at CHM. They want to give back and that's kind of where their passions lie. This is what the, uh, the outlook of the class was for that entered in 2020. So we take 190, we only had 188 last year um, matriculate. So that being said, if we don't have 190 that we really, really want, that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to go to 190. The average age was 24 that entered as an M1. I, this is one of my favorite things about MSU. We almost always have like a career changer or some non-traditional students who are coming just um, not with the traditional route. And so you'll see a couple of those every year, 53% women and 47% men. That's kind of along the lines of the national trend used to be a very male dominated um, profession and now it's really kind of shifted to a more equal playing field and even a little bit more female than male. Michigan residents made up 80% of our entering class for 2020. So we do give a preference for students who are from Michigan. Um, part of that is because Michigan students are more likely to fulfill the mission of serving Michigan communities, right? They're more than likely going to want to stay in Michigan after they're done grad graduating or they want to come back after their residency or something like that. So we are one of few schools who do accept out-of-state students, but we do give a preference towards Michigan residents. 60% of our students are disadvantaged. 24% came from a rural background. 48% identify as a race or ethnicity other than white. 19% were underrepresented in medicine. Um, that is down a little bit from the year before, um, but we usually sit between 20 and 25%. Obviously, everybody that comes to us holds a bachelor's degree, but we did have 29 masters and one doctor. So I mentioned we have those career changers. Um, I actually, I know a couple years ago, they had a uh, JD who that was their intention all along. They wanted both of those. Um, so I thought that was a cool kind of career trajectory for them. And the class that just left us to head to residency um, in May, this was a great year. We had 99% residency placement at the time of graduation. And now that student um, who wasn't placed at the time has now been placed too. So that's really great. Our top six areas of specialty were family medicine, internal, emergency, pediatrics, uh, obstetrics and gynecology, and general surgery. But you would see almost 30 different specialties that we sent students into residency for. Those were just kind of the most common, and those are pretty much the most common anywhere that you're going to look. 42% entered a primary care residency, and 43% of the class remained in Michigan for those residencies. Sorry, sometimes when you're on Zoom all day and talking, it gets harder and harder to get your words to come out clearly <laughs> towards the end of the day. 
Um, as always, our students are matched to some of the most competitive programs in the country. So let's say that you want to do a residency out of state. That's not something that we're gonna look negatively at. Um, it's really the overall goal and what your mission is as a physician. We love sending our students to residencies at some of the most well-known um, hospitals and healthcare systems in the country. Um, our hope is that as many of them as possible come back and serve the most needy communities within Michigan. So applying, so we, if you are applying for the next regular cycle, you know, that application opens in the summer, it's very similar timeline every year. Even through COVID, a lot of the timeline stayed very similar. School, different institutions had different flexibility around the MCAT or we require a CASPER test and that kind of thing. But for the most part, the timeline stayed super similar and you can go on to AMCAS's website to see um, kind of what that looks like. So when you apply, you have an initial review by our admissions office. If you are invited to interview, it's a virtual experience this cycle. I am hopeful, I'm optimistic that this is the only cycle that we have to do this for. Um, I am fairly new to the College of Human Medicine, but we had a multiple mini interview set up that I thought was so unique and interesting and so well received by interviewees. Um, and I'm really hoping we can move back to that. So that being said, um, Currently, a virtual experience is taking place, a 30-minute interview with a medical student and a 30-minute interview with a faculty member. Should we move back to the in-person, it would be the 30-minute um, interview with the student, as well as the eight station, multiple mini interview, um, more behavioral type questions, kind of rapid fire moving through the stations, a really nice on-campus, um, all-day experience for a student. So that's what you can kind of expect, um, one or the other, depending on, on what what COVID decides to do and how we respond to COVID, right? So after your interview, no matter how you think that went, it goes to our committee. Um, and our committee on admissions is made up of 15 faculty members, some of our College of Human Medicine students, and it's a secret ballot and you're kind of de-identified in that. So you're on a very equal playing field. It's a very equitable process throughout the entire thing for all of our students. Um, can take anywhere from six to eight weeks after that though to hear back um, after you're interviewed to hear back from us. After committee, it's pretty quick. These are the prerequisite models that we offer. Um, I, I like to preface with this isn't really as complicated as I think it makes it sound when you look through this. Um, if you work with your pre-med advisor, you're moving through the prerequisite model just fine, most likely. So these are, these are the most um, commonly used prerequisite models that we have, the MCAT Influence and the Endpoint coursework. Almost all of you are going to move through the MCAT Influence prep model. Some people will use Endpoint, but it's, it's a huge majority that move through the MCAT. There are two other uh, prerequisite models on our website if you want to look at them, but, but I promise um, the majority the 99% of you would not would not need either of those. Um, if you are planning on using one of those two, I would really connect with your pre-med advisor and stay in touch with them. It's really just telling you what courses you have to take, like any other type of prereq model. I think sometimes people see all four of them and they they think, oh gosh, did I pick the wrong one? No, it's it's not as complicated as it might seem on the site. So take home points when applying. Um, I think one of the biggest things for CHM, as I have mentioned, is our mission. Um, so your academics are going to be important. Nobody's going to tell you that they're that they're not. Um, no matter what med school you apply to, um, academic competition is still incredibly stiff across the country and only getting more so. So last year we had 8,000 something applications. This year we have over 11,000. Um, so it's getting more and more competitive. We have absolutely no GPA cutoff and we have absolutely no MCAT cut off. So that means that if one of those is not where you want it, but you think you have a very holistic, well-rounded, lots of experiences, um, great personal statement, whatever whatever else is, is making up your application, if you think that that's great and you are, feel ready to submit it, um, it means that you can. It means that there is no GPA cutoff that's going to disqualify you and there's no MCAT cutoff that's going to disqualify you. Here is a little bit of info on MCAT preparation. Again, with through COVID, as we are paying attention to an MCAT get canceled or rescheduled or things like that, we are being as flexible as we can with the MCAT and making sure students have ample time and opportunity to prepare and take that or retake it if they need to. Understand where you are in terms of strengths and weaknesses on 
standardized testing. And that looks a little bit different for everybody. Um, so just make sure that you understand where you are and then that you use the resources that the AAMC provides to you. There are tons of practice tests out there and the AAMC is not the only place that provides practice tests. And there are a lot of external resources too. My big piece of advice is make sure that you really use those free resources before you start paying. Um, there are a ton of free resources out there for you, um, full length, half length tests that you can take. Um, just make sure that you've used those and that you've, before you move on to the paid stuff. The whole med school process is expensive and we know that and we wanna make sure um, that you are utilizing those free resources the best that you can. Take the necessary time. This average student needs about 400 hours. If you know you have some bigger weaknesses on standardized tests, then you'll probably need to a lot, a lot for more. Um, and then make sure you understand the way the test is structured. And that goes back to taking those practice tests, the full length, the half length, understanding where you are with all of that. This is just the average. Um, so we, we don't have a cutoff. So that's to say that, yes, there have been students under 500 who have matriculated into the College of Human Medicine. This is just a guideline that we're going to give our students. So this is the national mean. Our average for our matriculating class the last couple of years has been 506 and 507. So that's just kind of for you to know. And this just goes to show that even students with the highest academics are not necessarily being accepted to medical school. And it just further proves that making sure that your service experiences, your clinical experiences, um, your mission fit for different institutions is in your application as well. Um, and for a lot of us, it's equally as important that you give back to your community. It's equally as important that you shadow and that you um, have other types of clinical experiences. 90% um, of students with the highest uh, T or MCAT and GPA are getting accepted in medical school, but that's 10% with that high of an academic mark that are not getting accepted to med school. So just make sure that that's, it's not discouraging you if maybe you're not at the highest academic marks, if you have a really well-rounded application, you've been involved in undergrad, during your undergrad time, that kind of thing. So these are some of those things in the holistic review. We talked a lot about those academic metrics, but then it goes into the activities, those experiences that are equally important in making a well-rounded, um, med school application. So those first two are kind of the most critical to us and that we look for in everybody. Clinical activities and community service. Now those can count double. You could do community service that's also medical clinical, um, but you don't have to. What matters to us in community service is that it is with an organization or in a community that you're passionate about that really needs you, that kind of thing. But if it doubles as you getting clinical hours too, that's great. And that what a good use of your time, um, but doesn't have to be. Make sure that it's just meaningful for you. Other activities, life experiences, leadership and teamwork activities. Um, we see, you know, even athletics on there sometimes as leadership and teamwork. Um, other types of employment that demonstrate um, other life skills that you think are really beneficial. Um, research opportunities and then demonstrated ability to educate. And then obviously below personal characteristics, <clears throat> personal characteristics, these things are harder to gauge in a GPA and a test score, right? But we can start to be able to gauge these things through personal statements, through the different experiences that you've participated in and through things like, of course, the CASPER test, which we require. Um, not every med school requires, but it is kind of growing in who requires it. Okay, and then supporting your application. So this one, I think um, this first point is one of the most important things for you to consider as you're gathering all of your application materials. So you need to acquire three to five letters of recommendation. These are obviously, we all know letters of recommendation are things that other people write about us. So really taking into consideration who's writing these for us, building our network of professors, physicians we work with, um, supervisors in employment that aren't medically related are fine too. Um, coaches, other, other types of people who can really tell us about you in a way that you can. So your pre-med advisor is a good person to talk to about good people to write your letters. 
but making sure that these people are going to advocate for you the absolute best that anybody could. I think that's critical. Um, you know, the relationship that you build with one of your science professors and, and them being able to say, I know that this student will exceed, will excel in medical school. I've seen some really short, not really thoughtful letters come through and I've seen pages and pages of letters come through that they just rave about somebody. So just making sure that you are thinking about who would write the best letters for you. You don't get to see them before we do. You actually have to sign off and say like, you can send it to the school. I don't see it, I don't know. So you really wanna trust that that person's writing well about you. Record and reflect upon your experiences. So on the MCAS application, when you're listing out um, the experiences that you wanna tell us about, you get a chance to list three as your most meaningful. So make sure that you really reflect on why those are most meaningful and hint, hint why they make you a good fit for MSU. I'm gonna talk briefly about um, some of our certificate programs um, or our specialty programs, I guess you would call some of them. So this first one isn't necessarily a certificate, um, but it is a program that students enter into before our regular curriculum. So ABLE is the Advanced Baccalaureate Learning Experience. It's a year long program for applicants who are um, disadvantaged, don't quite meet academic marks, but meet all of our other expectations, have great experiences, have the capacity to do well, um, something like that. We would recommend this student be a part of ABLE and that program would be a year long and you'd get coursework done that show, demonstrates your readiness. And if you successfully complete that program, you are guaranteed admission into the following cycle. Um, so again, you'd be like slightly lower than average academics and we, but we would see sign, kind of some potential or some great experiences, that kind of thing and we would recommend you. The thing about ABLE that I get asked a lot though is how you apply. And for ABLE, you do not apply specifically to ABLE. ABLE is a program where if your application comes through our regular cycle and we see it and we say this person would be a good fit for ABLE, we would then nominate you for it. But it isn't a program that you as a prospective student could apply for. The first certificate program is the Leadership in Rural Medicine. So um, one of our underserved target communities are rural underrepresented or rural underserved communities. So we have two different um, programs within the Leadership in Rural Medicine and that's the Rural Physician Program. If you choose to study in the Rural Physician Program as part of LRM, you, your third and fourth year would be spent in Marquette in the UP. If you choose to study the Rural Community Health Program, you would be in either Traverse City or Midland. So that goes back to the beginning of the presentation when I mentioned that a certificate program could kind of determine where you would be in your third or fourth year. Um, so slight differences, but really focused on serving rural communities whose access to healthcare has been you know, driving two hours or driving three hours um, to specialists or something like that. The next one is leadership in medicine for the underserved. So this one again, kind of tells you where you're going your third and fourth year, which is Flint. Um, so our Flint Community Campus houses this program and um, our um, public health certificate options as well. This program also includes a global health opportunity where students in their fourth year would be required to do an international program. I mean, it's a shorter duration. I can't remember exactly how long, um, but you'd be required to do that in your fourth year. It did unfortunately get canceled for our fourth year students this year, and that was very sad. But some of the countries listed there, Ghana, Uganda, Peru, Costa Rica, India, Cuba, have been some of the places that they've gotten to go. Medical partners in public health. This is also in Flint. This has become a lot more popular probably due to the public health involvement in public health crises like COVID-19. So um, all of these certificate programs you can apply for at the time of your AMCAS application, but if you do decide at a later time, please reach out to us as long as there's room, we would let you apply later. And then a little bit about the shared discovery curriculum. So I mentioned that we, this was a really innovative curriculum that we started five years ago. I think there have been two, two cohorts that have gone through the entire entire set of curriculum. So we're starting to see results from it and really gain um, some knowledge about our success with this 
shared discovery curriculum. So the biggest thing about it, it puts you in clinical settings a lot earlier in your education. It removes kind of that lecture style um, and really has you focused on clinical based hands on learning. Um, so the fully integrated curriculum, collaborative support, the collaborative support is that um, learning society that you're placed in in your first year and your learning society has like um, a faculty head. So they describe it a lot as um, I'm a, I'm a Harry Potter fan, but if you are all not, you probably won't get the reference to the houses and um, the sorting hat and you're sorted, not to, not with a hat, but more a little more randomly than that. But there are four learning societies um, and you have a faculty advisor and that kind of thing. And you meet with them really regularly and you're able to connect with those advisors and students throughout the different years of medical school. And um, while they mentor you at first, then you grow into a mentor for the students who enter your learning society. So that's pretty neat. You build a portfolio of competencies that you've actually acquired by doing. Um, and we take fewer tests throughout this curriculum. There are still ways to measure your success. You are still tested throughout, but a lot fewer. Um, and a lot of the stuff that we do is pass and fail and not necessarily on a grade. So these are some of the differences. Um, I touched on the clinical experiences a lot, but these are some of the differences to the uh, SDC, Shared Discovery Curriculum that will differ from a traditional learning environment at a medical school. So chief complaints and concerns, they describe this a lot as a patient doesn't come in and tell you there's a problem with my respiratory system. They're gonna come in and say, my chest hurts when I cough or something a lot more basic because that's the way that we understand it. Um, so we'll go through all the, the science behind a cough and all of the things that could be in, and stuff like that. And it, they'll break it down from basic to the most complex. And so you get a really, really good feel for how to communicate that to a patient and what these different sy symptoms could be. Clinical experiences touched on that right from the get go. Intercession, these are really neat, um, shorter duration courses that you'll take at the end of each regular academic year. So early summer. Um, late spring, early summer. And some of these are decided for you, like the topic areas, but some you get to decide for yourself. So there's there are things like um, healthcare policy and that things that aren't super clinical heavy and that you can create yourself even if you don't see a subject area that's of interest to you. The Academy and Learning Societies touched on those. Just in time medicine is just the software that we use that drives the curriculum that measures success, things like that. This is actually something you could go look at if you wanted to. You wouldn't obviously have a login access, but you could go look at how it works um, and see kind of what's available to you. The progress suite of assessments, that's what I mentioned. We aren't taking as many tests, but this is our suite of assessments that makes sure that you're staying on pace throughout the whole um, time that you're with us and provides you a lot better feedback throughout your time. And finally, again, we say it a lot, but it really is about fit for us. So we get a lot of candidates that are qualified every year, and we look for the ones that really match CHM's mission um, and can bring kind of that unique piece to us. Are there any questions for me? I hope that there are. You can, um, where's, I think there's enough of you that you're, oh no, there are two pages. So if you want to use the raise hand feature or just type it in the chat, that'd be swell, whatever you'd rather do. Um, I have a question actually. Uh, I don't know if you mentioned it. I know you touched base on the certificate programs, but do you guys offer a dual degree? We do. We have an MD PhD that's um, the most complicated to get into process wise and obviously the longest in duration. Um, so if you are interested in that, you do have to then actually additionally apply to the graduate school, choose a PhD of interest, that sort of thing. And then we have the MD MBA and the MD um, MPH options as well. I have a quick question. So how do you guys look at gap years? And if we particularly spend the gap year like in non-medical activities, but they're still related to our interests, like is that looked upon negatively? Could you repeat that for me, please? 
Yeah, like I'll give you an example. For example, I'm taking a gap year. I'm graduating this semester. And in, so I'm planning on either scribing or becoming a personal trainer. Now say that I go and become a personal trainer for a year because I believe it will benefit me. Is that seen negatively because I could have been a scribe and that's more medical rather than personal training? Like, I think it depends on what your other experiences are that you're going to say that you have. Um, so that's probably not a one size fits all answer. Medical scribing is definitely one of the more common clinical experiences that we see listed and definitely counts, gives good um, clinical experience to students. But that being said, a personal trainer, um, if that's something that you're passionate about and you have other clinical experiences, there's nothing to say that it would be held against you. Okay, that helps. Thank you. Uh, so we actually have a question in the chat from Richard. Um, he asked, I heard you say MSUCHM is the first community-based medical school. Can you elaborate upon what is a community-based medical school and how it differs from a normal medical school? Sure. So a lot of, first, a lot of institutions now do have a community-based mindset and do have students out in various communities and things like that. But ours was the first that really started with community outreach into underserved communities like the rural areas in the Upper Peninsula, um, like underrepresented and short-staffed hospitals in, in urban areas, that kind of thing. Um, so it really now doesn't differ a ton. I think that a lot of medical schools have moved that direction. We just kind of prided ourselves on being um, the first and again, probably the most mission centric. Yeah, thank you for answering that. Um, I actually had a question regarding clinical experiences. So um, my mom wants to be a PA and I was listening to um, one of the chats that she had with the admissions from U of M Flint. And they were saying that uh, for their program, they would prefer to see paid experiences because there's a level of uh, responsibility that goes with being a paid employee. And I was just wondering what you guys, how you guys view unpaid clinical versus paid clinical experiences. I don't think that it really matters that much if it's unpaid or paid. And I say, I don't, I don't think because I've read thousands of applications and I couldn't tell you that I was ever like, oh, that was paid or, oh, that was unpaid. Um, I think that we see, because, and because we see a lot of community service that's clinical. Um, so I kind of put it in the same category. Does that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I was nervous when they were saying that. I was like, oh, I didn't know that <laughs> they cared so much, but. I have a question. Um, how much emphasis do you guys place on research experience? So we don't have a research requirement by any means. Um, most people, I, I shouldn't say most, I see a lot of, a lot of applications with research experience. Um, but it isn't a requirement for us. And I think um, going back to Richard's question, that's probably one of the bigger differences um, in our approach to education and com being community-based. Um, we have opportunities for students to research, but our goal is that you are physicians who serve patients. Um, so we don't have as big of an emphasis on the research component. Thank you. Um, I guess I could ask, uh, since there's a lot of us here who aren't Michigan State students, um, I was just wondering how someone who's not from MSU can become more involved so that we show that we do have an interest in um, MSU CHM before we apply. Yeah, so um, of our 190 students, MSU is not the largest undergraduate feeder, just so you know. So it's not um, you, you enter at a pretty equal playing field regardless of what undergrad institution you come from. Um, sure, if you're, you're from MSU, you, you could say you have already that connection, um, but CHM operates um, pretty autonomously. And so we really are, um, we're proud of MSU and are proud to be part of MSU, but it doesn't give an MSU student an advantage by any means. 
if you um, get involved in things in the East Lansing area, I guess, but I, I think that that's probably shouldn't be your biggest worry. I had a quick question about GPA. Um, how would you look, would you pay attention to an application or applicant whose GPA started off low, but there has been a strong upward trend or would the applicant have to specifically mention that aspect of their application within an essay or part of their personal statement or something of that sort? To be honest, maybe both. I, I, we would absolutely notice your upward trend, um, but would probably love to read an explanation of your um, struggles in that first or second year, or both or whatever your story might be. With the number, the competitiveness and number of applications that we read, we, we do tend to notice every detail. Um, I don't want you to fret over that comment, but I would, I would definitely say we would notice an upward trend. Um, but then we also might notice if you don't tell us about why. So I would, I would highly recommend both telling us about it and, um, well, not both because we will notice, but also telling us about it. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, do you guys, I know some programs offer early decision and I didn't like hear any mention of it. So I was just wondering if you guys uh, participate in that. Yeah, so I actually took off our early assurance slides because our early assurance opportunity and our early assurance program are only available to partner institutions. Um, and Wayne State isn't a partner institution for early assurance. We don't have a lot of early assurance partnerships with schools who have their own med school. That's probably why it's just kind of playing nice with other med schools. Um, MSU doesn't have early assurance with um, U of M or Oakland or things like that. So, so for Wayne State, unfortunately, there is not an early assurance program. Um, I had a question in regards to research. I know that um, previously you said there isn't a huge emphasis on research, um, but how would someone who, let's say, um, would a participation in like Abercams or other conferences help the student to stand out or would different research positions or experiences will help a student to reach out or not reach out or be more um, unique or stand out? Yeah, so we get, we get that question a lot, like how can I stand out? Um, and when I say we don't have a huge emphasis on research, that doesn't mean it's not important. That doesn't mean you shouldn't do it if the opportunity comes up. By all means, it will look very good in your experiences section. Um, it's just not a requirement where I feel like some institutions have um, at least some level of research requirement. Um, as far as conference attendance and organization membership, we see all of that stuff too. Um, and we're, we're less concerned about you checking boxes of what you think we would like to see um, than you participating in things that mean a lot to you and that you wanna participate in. You should take up as many opportunities as you can, but definitely be less concerned with what you think we'd like to see um, and be authentic in your experiences and participate in things you'd like to participate in. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, I just had a quick question. So I'm a Canadian student and I was just wondering how international students are kind of factored into the whole admissions process. Yeah, so we don't take international students, but we but we don't consider Canadian students international students. So you you okay. can apply. Um, okay. But currently, our, our College of Human Medicine doesn't have a pathway for students outside of the U.S. and Canada. Um, okay. But the College of Osteopathic Medicine, if you have any friends that are international students, they have a pathway to degree. But Canadian students are welcome to apply to us. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yep. We have plenty of time, but I am going to throw my email address in the chat just so you guys know. Thank you for that. Um, so I have a question because I know I've started to work on 
filling out like the slots for my application um, for this upcoming cycle. And I was just wondering if it's viewed poorly if you have a lot of activities, even if you participate a lot. But I, you know, my concern was if I put a lot of activities down, will it look like I was just doing something to fill a box in? And should I just omit certain activities at that point? I don't think you should omit things that you've done. Um, there's a there's a reason that there is a place for you to describe your activities. And the people who interview and read applications and make these decisions, they've been doing it for so long, they can tell if you're just trying to, to do what you, you think you should do. Um, so when Soha asked, you know, will this make me look better? Um, if you do it and you give us a meaningful experience and it seems like you cared about it, then yes. But if you are just doing it to do it, um, then maybe think about getting additional hours in something that matters to you. Um, because what you list matters, the hours you list matter, um, the way you describe the experience matter. And I think we just want to get away from the idea that doing more is the answer. Um, because if you're going to do more, it needs to be quality more and it needs to be meaningful more. There's so many different types of activities um, for you to choose from that most people end up filling the majority of them up. Yeah, thank you for that. I was like, my, I, I, maybe I'm just an anxious person. I'm like, I'm overthinking it, but. <laughs> I think, um, and again, I am I am fairly new to the College of Human Medicine and uh, we in admissions are some of the only ones without um, medical degrees. So we have a very unique perspective on it when we go through it. Um, and I wouldn't say that medical students overthink, but the process to achieving this goal is far more daunting than other career paths. Um, and it gets more competitive every year. And so there's always a caveat to whatever answer we give to, right? Like I say, we want you to be authentic, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't have any community service experience. You know what I mean? Like we want you to be authentic, but you do still have to go out and find those types of experiences that matter to you um, and do those things. And obviously if you only have one experience and the rest of the pool that year has 10 experiences, you know, th that type of stuff does matter. But at the end of the day, I think it really does come down to letting who you are come through in an application, being competitive and a, and a little bit of everything. And, and um, even my dean will say now, you know, it's 30 years ago, he says, I don't know if I'd get into medical school today as compared to when I applied 30 years ago. Um, so yeah, maybe you feel like you're overthinking it, but it is an incredibly daunting task and you should all be proud of yourself for even taking it on. Um, in regards to the pandemic, um, students don't really have as much opportunities to, you know, volunteer and do all the extracurriculars that they once were able to like shadow and stuff like that in person, you know, um, how is this kind of impacting how you guys view the applications, you know, um, Club Med Virtual, they're doing um, online shadowing which I find it cool. Like it's a nice replacement, I guess, because of this. So uh, how are you guys responding to this? Yeah, so we're offering flexibility where we can. I think that the tough answer is we're always going to take the most competitive applicants that come through a pool. And every pool is going to look different, right? So um, this year's applicants maybe weren't as terribly affected by COVID because it didn't hit till March and most of them were ready to you know, apply. We're interested to see what this next cycle of applicants looks like with people who had to deal with COVID for the whole year. So take what opportunities come your way, but at the end of the day, it's, gonna, it's going to be the most competitive applicants in a pool like any other year and we just don't know what that will look like. So if you feel as though you could wait another year and acquire more experiences or work as a scribe or work as a personal trainer or all these other things that might come your way as opportunities, 
another application cycle is going to, to be there, right? Which isn't what everybody wants to hear because you have your own life plans and your own goals and things like that. Um, but that's the unfortunate circumstance around COVID as well. We just, we don't know what the site, what the pool's going to look like next year. And that's another thing I think is a misconception about medical school. Sometimes people think a gap year looks bad. And I would argue completely that it, that it absolutely does not. Um, how you spend your time when you're not when you're not, um, or when you're in your gap year or years even, um, says a lot, but we take students who are 40 years old, who are career changers, who maybe spent 10 years of that, not doing anything medically related. So, um, good luck. Take the virtual experiences. If you think they're worthwhile, don't pay for any of those, please. Um, I guess there are a couple of scams going around offering opportunities. Please don't pay for anything. <laughs> Yeah, thank you for that. Um, we'll take about two more questions because I know you said you have a meeting right at seven. So I want to be respectful of your time. Thank you. And don't forget your attendance survey. <laughs> uh, for WSU students. <laughs> um, so I, I guess I have a question regarding um, I think most of us were worried about the admissions process, but I was wondering um, what sort of resources you guys have for students who are admitted into your program if they're struggling with uh, courses. If you guys have like tutors or um, TAs that help with the classes in case students are struggling with, I know like the first years are the ones that usually break students, but yeah, we have academic support services, we have tutoring services, we have like student wellness that offers yoga. And so we're very, we try to be very aware of students, um, individual success and collective success. That is something that people, when you talk to students who go to CHM currently, they talk about how collaborative it is. So some medical school, it's a competitive, everybody wants to be the top of the class. Um, but because of our pass fail idea and like the learning societies and things like that, it's far more collaborative as opposed to competitive. Um, and so that being said, everybody's helping you get through. But then of course you have the more traditional services like tutoring and um, the student support services. And um, what is that office called? It's student wellness. Um, let me find it. Academic achievement. That's all. That's the only name I couldn't remember. Okay. So they stay in touch with you. Um, and I'll post that link right here as well. If we don't have any other questions, um, and I can just say the outro, but thank you so much for the incredible and insightful session, Jessica. Uh, I really enjoyed how informative you were, and I hope to have a session with you again in the future. To our WSU students, please make sure you complete the Google survey posted in our Zoom chat, summarizing the session to obtain your shadow hours. Thank you all, and I hope you have a great night.